Welcome back. The abrupt ending, which I will try and edit out, demonstrates conclusively that I really don't have any idea what I'm doing. But we're going to continue talking about classical economists. There are two things I need to say here. First of all, Adam Smith and all classical economists after him believe that the economy operated always at full employment. In fact, the full employment of all resources. This was a Say's Law circular flow economy to them where supply creates its own demand. So the notion of involuntary unemployment was an impossibility in this framework. Secondly, as I mentioned in the first video, um, we are taking a look at the history of economic thought from the externalist position where economics changes as a result of conflict and disagreement over how the economy works. And this begins immediately with David Ricardo and um, Thomas Malthus. In 1817, David Ricardo writes a book called uh, The Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. And in this, he makes three significant contributions to classical economics. The first is his emphasis on deductive logical analysis, okay? He was not interested in the empirical reality around him. He was trying to develop general theories, and he did this by making assumptions, applying logic, and drawing conclusions from that logic that were true deductively, like a math problem. And in fact, this approach is what drove us to uh, using mathematics to describe the economy. This was different from Adam Smith. Adam Smith did use deductive analysis, all cl uh, classical economists did, but Adam Smith also used empirical work and historical work. He looked at how the economy was actually working and used that as well to formulate his theory. There was none of that with David Ricardo. It was all about logical analysis, right? This is the framework that we still use in microeconomics. We derive the theory logically, and only then do we look at the economy to see if it makes any sense. So this approach uh, became the direction that mainstream economics from classical economics till today still follows. That's a methodological contribution. David Ricardo used deductive methods to make two substantial theoretical contributions that are still important today. The first is his theory of rent, and it's called Ricardian rent. Now, we tend to think of rent as in terms of housing or real estate or something like that, and that was the origin of this for David Ricardo, but it became larger than that. An economic rent for economists is the differential paid to a superior quality input over an inferior quality input. All right? So if you have a better input, you can demand more for it than you can if you are selling an inferior input. The example he used was real estate. He said, suppose there is free land available and People go out and they take any land they want. And of course, the first people there are going to take the highest quality land. Let's say that's A quality land. Latecomers will take the available land, which will not be as efficient or productive, and we'll call that B quality land. Now, let's say you're a farmer and you want to rent some land. Obviously, you can rent B quality land cheaper because it's less productive, then A quality land. A quality land will be more expensive. The difference between the price of the A quality land and the price of the B quality land is the rent, the Ricardian rent or the economic rent that accrues to the person who sells the A quality land. Okay, we find this all throughout the economy. If you own a superior resource, when you sell it, you get more for it than somebody who has a superior, an inferior resource. So if you have a house in Geneva, 
you can sell that for a certain price. If you have a house on Seneca Lake in Geneva, it's much more valuable than the house in Geneva, even if the two houses are identical, right? And so the difference in the price of those two houses is the economic rent that goes to the person who has the lakefront property as opposed to the person who just has exactly the same house in a nice neighborhood in Geneva. We still use this concept today and it is very important because of course you can't assume all resources are identical. The third thing he contributed is an analysis, a deductive analysis of free trade. You'll notice with rent, no reality was involved until I gave you an example. His example was completely uh, theoretical. He did the same thing with free trade. He said, okay, if you have country one and country two, and they both produce two goods, say wine and cloth, if one country has an absolute advantage in cloth and the other one has an absolute advantage in wine, then the one that is the more efficient producer of wine should export wine to the one who is more efficient in production of cloth. And when they exchange, because the more ex efficient good is going to the opposite market, then the cost of consumers goes down and both sets of consumers in country one and country two improve. Their standard of living improves. That's called absolute advantage. And that's fairly obvious. What Ricardo also deduced was the notion that came to be called comparative advantage. Now, he didn't call it that, all right? Um, that name was given to it by John Stuart Mill many years later, another classical economist. But here's the idea. Let's say that one country has an advantage in the production of cloth and an advantage in the production of wine. The other country is a less efficient producer of cloth and a less, less efficient producer of wine. And that efficiency is manifest in costs. There will be an internal ratio of costs, okay, in each country. Comparative advantage looks at those relative costs within each country. And if the ratio of efficiency of wine is greater than cloth, is bigger than the ratio of the efficiency of wine to cloth in the other country, then the one with the greater comparative relative efficiency should trade wine to the other for cloth. Now, the second country is disadvantaged in a cost perspective from both, but because the first country is so much more efficient relatively as well as absolutely in wine, they should export the wine because it will be cheaper for the second country. And even though they can produce cloth more efficiently than country two, it's better to use their resources for wine where they're more efficient and import the cloth from two, country two. And so this is a situation where it's comparative or relative advantage. Absolute advantage is irrelevant because country one has an absolute advantage in both commodities. And yet there are still gains to both countries from trading, all right? Country one, where the relative cost of wine to cloth is greater than in country two, where the relative cost of wine to cloth is lower, um, that first country should sell wine to country two, the second country should sell cloth to country one. And both sides gain from trade. This does not change the argument that trade should be free. It just demonstrates that any two countries, even if they both produce the same goods, can take advantage of the relative costs or relative prices or relative efficiencies in their country and trade the good where they have the relative advantage to another country, even if the other country is more efficient in the production of both goods. And both countries 
meaning both consumers will face lower prices for, than they would in the absence of international trade. Now, here's where the conflict comes in. Reverend Thomas Malthus writes two books that are very important. The first is in 1798, and it's called An Essay on the Principle of Population. And then in 1820, he writes a book called Principles of Political Economy. Thomas Malthus made two contributions to classical economics. He retained Adam Smith's approach of making both deductive logical arguments and employing inducted methods of empirical and historical research. He was also engaged in a long public debate over a policy in England called the Corn Laws. The Corn Laws were put in in 1815 and limited the importation of grain into the UK after the Napoleonic Wars, where grain was in short supply. Malthus was in favor of the Corn Laws, which is a restriction in free trade. David Ricardo was against the Poor Laws. I'm sorry, the Corn Laws. Now, Ricardo argued that not importing grain to sell when grain was already very expensive in England caused the price of grain to go up that increased the subsistence wages of workers, which meant workers had to be paid a larger percentage of revenue, leaving fewer profits for sellers, thereby limiting their ability to produce output, expand output, and expand supply, all right? Because they were paying so much in wages. And therefore, you should get rid of the corn laws, allow the importation of cheap grain, that would lower the price of grain, workers' subsistent wages would stay low, profits would stay higher, and that would encourage investment. Malthus made the exact opposite argument. He said, look, if we restrict the price, excuse me, the importation of grain, the price of grain will go up. In the short run, wages will have to go up, but the high price of grain will encourage farmers to expand the production of grain to capture that higher price. Eventually they will expand it enough so that the price of grain will go back down, but that short-term cost will result in the greater savings later on when the United Kingdom is self-sufficient in the importation of grain. So, both were looking at policies that would cause the grain to become cheaper. Ricardo focused on the immediate. Malthus looked at the long term. Um, and eventually the corn laws were repealed. So apparently Ricardo won that argument. Let's look at um, Thomas Malthus's controversial contributions. The first is the population doctrine. Okay, Malthus argued that agricultural production increased arithmetically, which he means um, linearly, but population expanded exponentially. Okay, so at this point in time, just this would be output and population on this axis. The population would exceed the capacity of the country to feed people, and you would have starvation and misery. And so he argued that the only way that society could avoid this starvation and misery was being a minister through moral restraint, right? So people would have to forego sex in order to keep the population down. Um, this remained a concern throughout classical economics, and it remains a concern today. The population of the world is going up. There's always um, problems or concerns that eventually the population will outstrip the food supply. It hasn't currently. There's more than enough grain, there's enough food in the world to feed everybody so that they don't starve, 
our problems are distributional. In the United States, we have an excess of food. We have to support the price of uh, food to sellers of food because agriculture is so productive here without price supports. The price that all agricultural products would sell at is zero. So we have to have price supports so that there's a rate of return that makes it worthwhile for agriculture. And one of the ways we do that is we give away a huge amount of food to other countries in the world and, in fact, to our own domestic population. But there's enough food to feed everybody. The trouble is getting the food to the people who need it, and there are many places in the world that can't afford to pay for the food and can't produce it themselves, and so malnutrition persists. But it's not a production problem, it's a distribution problem. For Malthus and for the classical economists, they were worried about the production problem. Now, notice this is a completely deductive argument made by Malthus. So you can see that he uses deductive arguments and empirical and historical arguments which we'll see in the next case. But this is purely deductive. And the important thing to notice is that it's based on the assumption of the arithmetic increase or linear increase in grain production and the exponential increase in population. Uh, both of those assumptions are false, and thus the conclusions don't follow. The rate of increase in agricultural production has exploded over the last 200 years. And again, the population has not outstripped it yet though there are periods and places where famine continues. Secondly, the population has not packed, practiced moral restraint in their sexuality. Obviously, the population is going up, though the technology of controlling reproduction um, is much better understood and was not available in the time of Malthus. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here is that that does not mean that population growth in our environment is not a hazard. If we are going to get to a point where we have a sustainable economy, the human population is going to have to be smaller. It has to get smaller so that we don't have to use so much energy and so much resources and don't create global warming or other environmental factors that would destroy the Earth. So it's not a ridiculous concern, but Malthus's theory does not hold the test of time. His second contribution is general gluts and depression. Okay, first of all, the first thing to remember is that the classical economists all accept a Say's Law economy, except for Malthus. They believe that supply creates its own demand and that there is always full employment in the economy because labor markets adjust to make sure that everybody's employed at at least a subsistence wage. Malthus pointed out that there could be a set of circumstances where consumers either did not purchase all the products offered for sale or for some reason could not afford to purchase all the products available for sale for any number of reasons, like an adverse distribution of income where working people didn't have enough to buy anything and rich people had enough, but they didn't money to buy anything, but they only bought what they needed so that a lot of output wouldn't get sold. And that this could lead to what he called a general glut. A glut means a surplus, a huge amount of goods going unsold. And that this could lead to a depression and employment levels below full employment. And of course, losses and unemployed resources in other ways. This could not happen in the classical system, and classical economists rejected it. So why are we talking about it? Well, because John Maynard Keynes resurrected this explanation in 1936 in his book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. And he pointed out that insufficient aggregate demand, meaning Consumers didn't buy enough goods, investors didn't buy enough investment goods, governments didn't buy enough goods and services, and exports were too low, that there was not enough demand to buy all the goods and services necessary, meaning insufficient aggregate demand, and that this would lead to a cycle of unemployment and economic decline, leading to depressions. All right? So, in 1936, what we find out from John Maynard Keynes is Malthus was correct. 
and the classical economists were all wrong. This will come up later when we talk about the last classical economist. But one of the things that Keynes said about Malthus in the general theory is it is better to see the truth vaguely than to be completely and totally wrong. And the totally wrong he was referring to was the rest of mainstream economics in the history of thought up until 1936, with one exception, the last classical economist, Karl Marx. The next set of videos will address the last classical economist and show how these conflicts that we see popping up in classical economics lead to the change to marginalist economics and the emergence of alternative schools of thought in economics. So I'm going to now shut this off and try and not muck.